I am president, and I took the job for the title of the Media Society. And it, of course, it's the smallest charities which have the grandest titles. And that's why I took it. And it's completely wonderful. And we punch above our weight and put on things a bit like this in places like the Grout Show and the Women's University Club. And we get people like lovely Alan Rusbridger, that was a fortnight ago, talking about his life, got a book out. And we had Charlene White, uh, her off of News at 10 on Monday. And we're going to have Charlotte Moore, the head of content at the BBC. I don't, it means head of television. It's a, a sort of ludicrous title. You will understand it, being very C-suite sort of people. She, and she is the possible next DG. Do you know this, do you, Peter? Oh, You've look, the word. come on. <laughs> Come on, I mean, so how that, could she not be? The book on how could stuff. she not be? <laughs> That's quite absolutely right. I hear what you're saying. So, so how did it all start? Your, well, no, not obsession. That's, that's really the wrong word. But uh, your interest, shall we say, in the media and all things to do with that. Oh, um, I th well, it was opportunism and nepotism because I've got a proper job, a day job, which is as a sort of low-end capitalist tool and I help people with their audiences, as people like to call it now. I mean, I started as a market researcher, and somehow market research is amazingly close to show business. <laughs> You'll be surprised. And, um, and then what actually happened, to get to be a, a writer, because I had no experience of it, I once written something for the Bow Group Journal. <laughs> Who knows what the Bow Group Journal is? And of the left or of the right? I mean, it's a sort of, it was then centre-right. It's moved sharply to the hard right recently. <laughs> um, but uh, at the time, I had a girlfriend who got taken up by a shiny magazine called Harper's and Queen. And she became a fashionista. And she became actually a men's fashionista. So the night before anything, she would lay out exactly what I should wear. You know, the whole thing, the kit on the floor. I've never forgotten it. But <laughs> after a time, I thought, I can do this. Oh, come on, I can do this. So I went to the editor and said, guess a job, I can do this. And they did. And I was allowed to write things that the audience wasn't actually interested in at all. So. For Harpers and Queen, which is the precursor of the thing now called Bazaar, which was a combination of a shiny big American fat, high fashion magazine and a Victorian society magazine, I would write about the things I was interested in, like my little friends, my little punk friends, or how disco derived from German electronic music and stuff. Now, Mrs. Sloan out there in Sloanshire, wasn't interested in that, but they allowed me to do it. And if you um, strut your stuff in magazines, if you were strutting your stuff in magazines at the beginning of the 80s, you would get recruited by mainstream media because they realised that the action was not happening in newspapers on television, but on, at the margins in magazines. And so you got recruited into those things. You got into the margins of television programmes as a, a sort of freak show. But you still, I mean, you still did that. I mean, you, you, um, I went you, were, on very, you were very quick to pick up on The Night Manager as a, as a sort of huge show. And you pitched that to The Sunday Times, did you not? Well, the, I, there was The Night Manager. And I thought, what's interesting about The Night Manager? There's a lot that's interesting about The Night Manager. But for me, the most interesting thing was the house that the Hugh Laurie sinister character actually lived in, which was on a sort of Mediterranean spit. <laughs> and it was entirely furnished, as, as far as I could see, from ochre. You know, it had that Fulham Road look. <laughs> and so, uh, um, and you saw it time and time again. And I thought, well, let's go to town, let's get inside the, uh, this character's mind. And the Hugh Laurie character was brilliantly cast and brilliantly described by Le Carrier. And let's see how it plays out in how this place looks. And his story was 
that he was an Etonian, but not a rich one. Mm. And he was always, you know, trying, he had to work. And at the same time, he had to look as if he was effortless, not peddling under the surface. And so you've got this sun-drenched island, linen-y look, the ochre look. Now, so it was, uh, because, of course, you, you also did this, that incredible thing on dictators, didn't you? I did. <laughs> I did. I mean, publishing I, today. <laughs> well, it's, it, was, it was completely wonderful. I did, uh, it was, actually. I, I recommend it very, very highly. My, <laughs> uh, uh, my book, Dictators' Homes, in America, publishes dictator style. And it, you know, how you can get tips from the homes of the m most horrible people in the world. <laughs> and I didn't realize quite how on the money it was, because this was uh, about nine years ago, until we got our new president of America. And Politico's, which is, is a sort of multi-platform um, publisher in, in Washington, rang and said in that very polite way that these American people are, ha do you think that your marvellous book bears any relationship to the decorative taste of our gorgeous, pouting new president? And all you could say was, lady, you got it in one. <laughs> because the thing about Trump's penthouse apartment at the top of Trump Tower is it's entirely done in the decorative tropes Nowadays, they call them the memes, the decorative tropes of autocrats, dictators, and choppers off of hands. <laughs> you know, it, it's that look. Everything in spray gold, you know, bad gold, spray gold. And it was actually designed, well done you. Um, <laughs> It was actually there, there goes the live streaming. <laughs> it was actually designed, as I learnt, the brain. You will all know that, that genius of design commentation, Stephen Bailey. Stephen Bailey told me that the person who designed this was somebody called Henry Conversano, <laughs> who designed, as you might expect, um, uh, Las Vegas casinos. <laughs> and that's why it looked that way. Everything is wrong, you know, in terms of the, the architecture, the proportions are all wrong. And of course, there isn't a book in the in the place except for the Muhammad Ali giant book. That's the only book in the house. But I mean, you're much, uh, people in America like you a lot though, don't they? I mean, you, Tom, you, you interviewed Tom Wolfe um, just before he died. He's dead, isn't he? He is, he is dead. dead. Yes, right. And I interviewed him just before he died in the same apartment, the same wonderful, rather, you know, establishment looking apartment that he'd lived in on the, on the Upper East Side that he lived in for about 30 years, and I'd interviewed him there 20 years before. And he was, by then, rather frail. You know, he'd had quadruple or whatever it's called, you know, bypass and all that. Um, but at the same time, he was very up about the world and very clever about the world, and he had parity of disdain, because just before the election, for Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. That <laughs> takes some doing. <laughs> but uh, you also, um, you make interesting television programs too. Uh, tell, tell us when, about the hip stuff. When I'm allowed to. When I'm allowed yeah, to. Hard, because the, co the commissioning system don't, don't. is terrible. Just don't, don't start on the commissioning system, please. The commissioning system is terrible. There are terrible. television people here. It's, and, it's, it's you know, very, it'll, very... Um, it'll do you no good at all. It's very, very difficult. Yeah, yeah, no. Well. I like to do hybrid things, and every so often someone allows me to do hybrid things, and you know, which are somewhere between current affairs and fun. <laughs> um, uh, and the last thing I did was my hipster handbook, where I went over there, or you know, roughly east. there, east, <laughs> and watched these people go by and talk to them a bit. A lot of beards. And a lot, a lot of beards and a lot of artisan food and drink. And then we went to Williamsburg in, in Brooklyn and so on much of the same. And it was very hard to keep a straight face. <laughs> this is a really, and I thought I'd done brilliantly, you know. 
<laughs> Absolutely, poker face, and I would say, you know, uh, tell me, Mr. X, about your beers. <laughs> and they're like, mm, 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 mm. <laughs> And then, when you actually watch it, I totally failed. I'm actually making those sort of, you know, terrible disapproval or, or mis misunderstanding, as Donald Trump would say. I simply... <laughs> Why are you, you know, why are you doing this? What's the, what is the point? Shouldn't you, shouldn't you get a proper job? But I mean, is this what, is, the is thing what that, my face is saying. I mean, but uh, this is the thing, isn't it? Recognizing tribes is very <clears throat> useful and something that you recognizing know. tribes is very useful. As in, you know, at the origin, the origins of the Sloan Ranger Handbook is a conversation with a, a great mentor of mine, Anne Barr, who was then deputy editor of Harper's and Queen and sort of saying, and they all wear those shoes. Mm. They all wear those shoes. And the moment you've done that, as actors say sometimes, the moment you've got the shoes right, you've got the story. <laughs> I think your story at the f initially is the having it all story. It's completely wonderful. Yeah. You know, an extraordinary success, lots of firsts, you know, fastest selling, biggest selling, all that stuff. And also, because you deserved it. It was great success, and you deserved it, and you worked for it, and you were very effective and tough in making sure you got it. Mm. You were really organized, and in that, it reminded me of George Michael, who was the, you know, when I first interviewed him back, at, back in the Dark Ages, the most determined, the most controlled, most planned out person I'd ever met. I thought, how do you know all these things at your age? And you knew what you wanted. And you had an argument with Simon Cowell. You, you toughed it out with Simon Cowell. So after all that, what could possibly go wrong? But you said, it did go wrong. How did it go wrong? Well, I guess... Who's that, Colin? Um, <laughs> it's your mum. Hi. Where are you? Your father's driving me mad. Um, well, funny... I mean, I would say it didn't go wrong. What I would say is because so many things went right, and, yeah, I did. I had a, a determined steeliness, um, which you need to be a pop star. And I interviewed Sam Smith recently, and he has that. Uh, and yet he's kind and warm, you know, so you don't want to become an asshole. And um, so because so many things went right, I'd got to the stage to see, well, what wasn't working, you know. And uh, yeah, I had, an I had an album that got to number one. I had a TV special, this is all in the same weekend, TV special, top five single, amazing house in Hackney, you know, world of interiors, designed. I thought, oh gosh, I'm perfect. Um, it's got the dog. Um, and I was miserable, absolutely miserable on that weekend. I remember thinking, oh gosh, so things have to be sorted out and this is going to be really hard. I, I wasn't having wasn't good in relationships. Um, I had sort of certain addictions, I would say more behavioural than, um, you know, drugs or anything like that. Um, and I had a breakdown. Yeah, I had an absolute breakdown. I had, because everything I thought that would make me happy, i.e. great success in work, you know, um, cars, houses, all that, wasn't. So I feel very fortunate that I could s sit there and go, well, gosh, I even got to a position where I realised none of that makes me happy, you know, which I sort of thought was all sort of mumbo-jumbo. And I had an awful breakdown. I mean, really bad. I got PTSD. I, I then got dis disassociation whilst I was doing cabaret. Um, and disassociation in Lederhosen is not to be recommended. Um, I, couldn't see, I couldn't see my face in the mirror. I didn't recognise people. I didn't recognise my family. Um, I was like I was the walking, a walking ghost. Um, 
and I had that for two and a half years. But anyway, in this whole process, I had to go into treatment uh, for trauma, uh, residential treatment, where you do art therapy, which I would highly recommend. The first day I went into treatment, they said, here's some plasticine. Um, you know, do something with it. And I remember thinking, what's happened to my life? <laughs> yeah. I was like, I was like, I'm 34 years old and I've got some fucking plasticine in front of me. Week three, I was all over that plasticine. I was like, that's my mother, that's my father. Crush, crush, crush. You know. Um, and I still do it now. Um, but yeah, I, I was so focused on one area of my life and I was ignoring another area, basically. Um, and it was really, really, really terribly hard. Um, but the best thing about really looking at working on oneself in an area that none of us are, um, what's the word, supported in, which is mental health and well-being, which is not in this country, and is getting so much better, and so much better in work, and in the workplace. You know, I had to look at that area. Um, and that's hard because, you know, not many people that I know do work, look in that area. Um, so the support, to try and find the support is hard um, because people don't want to look at themselves. So, you know, I always give the example of, of my mother, Annabelle Young, known throughout the home counties. And um, <laughs> <laughs> she's kind of cool, actually. She drives around in a Japanese sports car, which is like one of the quickest road cars. She's 64, so I freaking love her for that. She's got great qualities, but, you know, some qualities... She's passed down are not so good. Um, like lateness being one of them. And um, I said to her one day, you know, mummy, because um, I was living at home as well. I was, you know, really that ill. I went back to my, yeah. my parents. Um, and uh, I said, I've just, it's great news. I've just changed therapist. Um, I'm really excited about this. She was sitting there. She's got a miniature dachshund, Dora Carrington Young, on her lap. And she goes, yeah, I did 20 lengths in the swimming pool today. I said, you're not listening to a word I'm saying. You know, but it's a great example of her not being able to be able to sort of access anything, you know, talking about sort of mental well-being, you know, because obviously she's a different generation. Was that a bit of stiff upper lippery? I think it, I think it is. I think it's, I think it's a cultural thing. I think it's a can be a class thing as well. Mm. It's certainly, if I look at her, you know, this is a great thing about exploring oneself because, you know, I look back in generations uh, of my family and I think, well, you know, my father's father passed away after the war. Um, he killed himself from PTSD. My mother's father had PTSD and had a breakdown after the war. They were both hugely decorated. Um, and, you know, they didn't get certain things. My mum was mm. sent away to boarding school at six, my dad. But, you know, underneath, let's say, the, the, the things that could be seen as middle class, underneath that, it's just about getting love, you know. And there were areas where they didn't get love. So I, because I'd explored that, I don't have any, like, anger towards my parents because I'm like, well, you know, you had a bit of a shit time. So, you know, that's the beauty of exploring oneself. But certainly, you know... They've now, this is the great thing about exploring oneself, is some people pop up in your life that, you, that I would never expect would be, would even talk about something like anxiety, you know, or shame. And they have just risen to the fore. The most surprising people. I mean, my, my father, my mum's done great as well, but my father's been amazing. Amazing. You know, we talk about boundaries together. Yeah, and we're going off on holiday next week. Oh. I know, and it, it's, it's, it's great. I mean, he will drive me mad, but um, <laughs> I found him once talking to a croissant. Um, <laughs> and I really worry for his well-being. Um, you know, but he's great. He's great. And he's, you know, so working on oneself, suddenly the most surprising people pop up and they go, and this is the best thing. They go, so Chris, I do my podcast with, he goes, well, actually, I get anxiety. You know, 
and, and we've become much closer friends. And we did a TED talk on that, on friendship and opening up. You know, when I was feeling suicidal, you know, what opening up about that. And then he goes, yeah, shit, actually, sometimes, you know, this person drives me a bit mad. Or sometimes I'm in work and I sit in a meeting and I think, I don't know what I'm talking about. And I'm so anxious about doing this, you know, and he's, he's you know, so successful in his job. So that's, I think that's what's brilliant about what I've noticed in the workplace is that once you open up, other people will open up, you know? And is it more of a guy thing, that guys don't open up? I think they're two different things. I think, I mean, there's Brené Brown who talks about shame and she says, men are like, don't show weakness. So the big thing is about showing weakness. And, that, and so I think that's a big guy thing, big thing about masculinity. If I show weakness, then I'm vulnerable. And I think, what she says is for women, it's like never show that you're perhaps not coping, you know? Never show mm. that you don't have it all under control. And stereotypically, she would say like the house, the children and all that, because I mean, we're going very stereotypically into gender type, types. Obviously, it's you know, not like that. But if you, if you wanted to reduce it down to that, yes. And I think it's very hard to be, um, to be certainly masculinity and what it is to be a man has been hugely tested. Uh, and, you know, so it should be, yeah. And so when we think about what happened to you when it, it all came to a halt, as you've described, it's stuff that's before you were a pop prince. Mm. It wasn't, we can't blame show business for this. No. No, I mean, it not. It would be nice. It would be nice, yeah. But, uh, but no, 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 no. It was boarding school. You know, I went to a boarding school which was abusive, um, you know, sex, sexually, physically, emotionally. Um, and, you know, I would see kids thrown across the classroom. I saw a kid thro th thrown into a radiator by the teacher. But what was interesting, you mentioned Simon Cowell earlier. Bullies do not like, can spot people who can see through them. They can. So, so you know, they don't like it because there's someone that's more in, a, in a, an empowered position going, I know you. So they'll go for you. Even more, they'll go for you. Um, so I knew he'd go for me. But I had that steeliness mm. that it was like, you're, you are not going to take my career from me at all. I think, as I recall you said, <coughs> did any of you see this immortal interview, a conversation? Is it quite extraordinary? Was, I think he said that was average. And yes. you said, no, it isn't. Yeah. No, it isn't. It's, yeah. You've got to admit, it's more than average. Yeah. I said, you could never call that average, which was very out of character for me to be so kind of brazen to say that. Um, but I think there's times in people's lives when you say no, mm. you know, and those are the big moments. If it's a game of snakes and ladders, which it kind of is, you go up a ladder then. Um, and we all need those moments in relationships, friendships, the workplace, family. No, I won't stand for that. Yeah. But quite a lot of people in that situation where there was this extraordinary man with his extraordinary trousers, <laughs> and um, he had such power over your career chances, most people, uh, most of those kids would have bottled it there. Yeah, and they did, yeah. But I, I'd already been through, you know, I'd had my first sort of, let's say, bout of depression in that first year at university, um, which often happens, you know, people go away to university and then it's a different thing. Um, so I'd already started, you know, working through almost invisible um, barriers, you know, or hindrances. Um, so him, you know, no, so excuse me, I'd finished university by that point. Uh, so for him, I was like, oh, I know you, you, he didn't mean anything to me. It literally didn't mean anything. I wasn't scared of him. Um, but also I'd had experience, you know, I had done three years at university. And a lot of it was debating, mm. you know. So I wasn't, a lot of people he really preyed upon because they weren't, 
Bullies are always going to go for people that they know they can, you know, lord over. Mm. Um, but he couldn't. He couldn't over me. So you were thinking about all this stuff, sort of classifying it, building up a sort of theory uh, yeah. about how to deal with stuff from school, university on. And that gave you the confidence to do that and presumably gives you the confidence at the end of the day to do these podcasts and to be uh, so open about your your problems and how you've dealt with them. Yeah. It isn't a sudden thing. No, it's not a sudden thing. And there's something very... I remember when I first, you know, went into treatment and, you know, you'd get people saying, like... I remember my... my Great therapist. If anyone needs a therapist, she's brilliant. Um, uh, she'll give out cards afterwards. Uh, she said, you know, uh, this my therapist, Katrina, um, just be curious about this. And I remember going, you know, she, I'd be like, oh, I, you know, I feel, feel this. And she'd go, great, great moment to be curious. And I said, it's difficult to be curious when you can't see your face in the mirror, Katrina. Um, <laughs> past that, and she said, fair point, um, past that, she goes, once you start working on your stuff and clearing it, because it's all about clearing it, she goes, life will just open up and it will become easier. And the reason I say that is the podcast just sort of happened. But what happens is that's what happens. Suddenly things just happen. It's like, how did I get here? How did I end up with that person? Gosh, I've suddenly left my job and I'm doing this and I'm so much more content. How did I get this beautiful house? How did I get this beautiful house? <laughs> Not that. Um, how did I get interviewed by this beautiful man? Um, you know, so the podcast was one of the things that just sort of happened. But because I'd, and because I'd cleared all my stuff, I'm just quite happy to sit there and talk to Chris about today. Uh, you know, one of the things we spoke about recently was I was in rehearsals for this show. And I, ha I took two days off because I, my anxiety was... Because it's about managing as well. You know, I will always have anxiety, so it's about managing it. Um, and I had to take two days off. And it was really interesting, so I was like, gosh, they've been really good. You know, as a workplace, my bosses, the producers, were really good about it. They said, no problem. They recognised I would have, you know, if it carried on, I would have just not been able to work for a week, let's say. So I said, yeah, two days off, no problem. We'll modify things a bit. I come back, everything's fine. So the podcast can be used for Chris and I to kind of talk about our lives, and then we interview people who are, you know, wonderful, like Sam Smith, Peter Tatchell, Jeremy Corbyn was very, very interesting. He spoke about compost. Um, <laughs> The reason we spoke about compost is Chris and I, even though I have a politics degree, know nothing about politics, but he didn't know that at the time. But you know what the beauty of that podcast is actually, I don't think Jeremy, podcast has ever, uh, Jeremy Corbyn has ever spoken about compost before. So you actually get things, you actually get things from people, you know, that are way more personable and personal. Um, and it's been a triumph. It's been a real surprise and a triumph. He likes cast iron, Victorian cast iron manhole covers. He's a great expert in this. Is he? Yes. God, I wish we'd gone to that. Yes. Um, <laughs> we would have lost all our listeners. <laughs> <laughs> it, they're very highly recommended, these podcasts. You, it seems completely unstructured. Yeah, kind of is. I say that in a good way. It yeah, seems no, completely no, unstructured yeah, and yeah. completely unset up. And it's very, they're very, very satisfying conversations, either the two of you or pulling other people in or oh, whatever. Yeah, because we do it. Podcasts are very democratic. I would, I would recommend anyone to do their own podcast because, you know, you miss out. Yeah, you miss out the middleman um, or woman. And um, that's, what, that's what we do. So, the, so it's a lot more personal. And the, lis the listeners are getting something personal. We, we record a lot of it in our houses and we have the dogs, you know, coming, <laughs> coming in and out. Um, and then you get these big guests, you know, and they're having to deal with my Dachshund on their lap. You know, we had Tim Walker, the most incredible fashion photographer. I mean, really like up there with Nick Knight and 
all those people. You know, and he's got my border terrier just sitting on his lap. And they don't care because then it reduces them down to being, to losing that fear and any potential pomposity. Grey sofa. Grey sofa. Grey sofa. Yeah. And the bottom bit is very, very fascinating. The bottom bit for some pictures that are above the sofa. And you think, what's the rest of those pictures? What? What do you mean? The, the pictures which are above the sofa. Oh, yeah. It, it, you see that. Yes. But I want to see more. Oh, what, one, are, the, what are those pictures? One of them is, a, is, a, is an old um, French poster called If You Cough, you, Si Vous Toussez, and I can't remember the rest. If You Cough, Use This me, uh, Medicine. So it's an old you know, advertising thing, um, which I paid way too much money for. And um, it's probably only cost a fiver. It's probably reproduced. Um, <laughs> someone just printed it out in the back room. Thousand pounds, please. <gasps> Lovely, I'll pay more. Um, and another one is, a, is the only photo I have of me in my house, which is taken by a, a great photographer called Guy Roche. And it's my, you can't really see me. I'm looking down, it's my, me and my stylist in New York. And she's sort of probably trying to get me to breathe in more into my trousers and sewing me in. Um, and the reason I love that is it's a, just a beautiful photo, full stop. And also I love the people I work with. I've worked with them for... 12 years now. They are a great team, bless you. And, uh, but also, you know, talking about the work environment, you know, we all share stuff that's going on with us. You know, we do. So it feels safe. Like, work has to feel a safe space. It, it has to because we spend so much of our life there. Uh, it would be foolish to think that we would just ignore our well-being for the eight hours a day and uh, that we're in whichever job that we do. They have to, it has to feel safe. And I think more and more places are cottoning on to mental health and well-being. You can't just look at it for the one week of, you know, mental health week. It has to be across the whole calendar. And for people to open up, let's say like I do with my uh, team, you have to feel safe. So, so I'm really big on safe spaces being created to talk about well-being. Because um, otherwise it will just be like words in the air, and, uh, like you know, smoke uh, in the wind, it will just disappear. It has to be grounded in a sense of safety um, and that it's, gonna be, it's not going to be talked about outside that space. You know, it has to be confidential. So otherwise people aren't going to you know, open up. If someone's opening up for the first time, it is terrifying to say, to show any sense of, of weakness. You know, I've, I've been very fortunate to have worked through it. So I have no shame. That's the key. You've got to lift the shame. Shame is 50% of, of keeping all these things down. Um, and I don't have that. So I'm happy to, it would be very difficult for me to talk about um, my emotional well-being and, and what I'm feeling, you know, day to day if I had shame attached to it. Used you to have it? Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh. Oh, just, yeah, a lot of shame. What, and also, like... What about what? Being depressed. Being anxious. I spoke to someone... Ah, I went for dinner last night with quite a high-powered person. And, I mean, he's successful in business, my God. And he is going into hospital next week for something. And, and, and he was going, you know, I'm very stressed about it. And I said to him, I'm not surprised you're stressed about it. That's quite a stressful thing. And he literally went, <sighs> Because so much of it is us beating ourselves up for being stressed about something. I had it again the other day, a friend of mine who's in, in the show I was in. He's very stressed about work. And I said, yeah, that sounds really stressful. And again, he went, his eyes opened up. You know, suddenly I could see him relax. Because someone just said, you know, the validation of going, yeah, that is not surprise your stress, but the shame we put on, on ourselves for feeling anything other than 
100% happy and in control of everything is, is, is one of the major problems. But yeah, I felt a lot of shame. I hated myself. But also, you know, there's gay shame as well, which is, um, you know, which is a very particular thing. Uh, growing up in, in a society and from the age of, you know, naught, where people are saying that's wrong, that's disgusting, that's evil, you know, you're going to be turned to a pillar of salt, which was you know, in whichever Sodom and Gomorrah and all that. I remember thinking at age 10, I really don't want to be a pillar of salt. Um, <laughs> you know, I was like, what happens with the salt afterwards? Um, you know, all those things seep into our systems and we all have a shame for various things. Shame for being a man, shame for being a woman, you know. And then take, broaden it up, shame for just being a human being and having emotions. But yeah, I had a lot of it. Um, but then, then I worked on that. And that went actually pretty quickly once I kind of saw it for what it was. And now you're taking these ideas in various ways out to people through the podcasts, talking at people, involving them in this. Tell me a bit more about the way you're using your own experience to help other people. Well, it's amazing. Um, because there's something very powerful about going into any situation, whether I'm talking at a festival or, you know, I did a workshop the other day, you know, going in and like this, you know, having a conversation. It's amazing how much that gives permission to other people. And, and what, what I would say has been the most wonderful thing is after I do a talk or or after I have a conversation and then people will ask questions and open up, that's when it really starts to happen. Because suddenly someone else, I was, I was down in Bristol doing a talk and someone put up their hand. It was really beautiful actually. And you know, like sort of, and she said, I'm saying this for the first time, not just to you guys, but to anyone in my life, I get really bad anxiety. And it was just, it was, I mean, I, I feel very emotional about it in a wonderful way. Like, it was very beautiful, very, very beautiful that she said that and that she felt safe to say that. Um, and I don't, didn't expect that. It was great. And so there are lots of these kind of surprising things that happen from the talks because I don't, I just want to connect with people, you know. I just want to say it's okay you know, we are human beings, it's okay. And then also have intellectual conversations and say, well, you know, what is this in the wider context? What can you do in the workplace? How can you set things in motion that the workplace can become? Because, like, ideas of success and mental well, well-being and healthy, um, you know, being healthy in your mind and your body, they're not mutually exclusive. Like, the more happy someone is, the better they're going to be at their work. You know, you don't want to isolate people and just be like, no, just get on with it, get on the treadmill. There's lots of ways that we work still that aren't beneficial for uh, mental health or physical health. I mean, you know, conversations about the four-day week is very interesting, actually. It might seem crazy, but why not? Why not? I mean, that's only going to help people. You just feel fresher. You come to work, you feel fresher. You're more happy to be there. So... The, the, the talks have been brilliant and the opportunities for me that are coming from the talks. You know, I would never have thought, when I was walking, you know, when I used to walk bent over double around Albion Square where I used to live in Hackney with my poor, you know, long-suffering border terrier, um, thinking, why did I get this person? Um, you know, I could have been in the countryside, I've got someone that's having a breakdown. Um, you know, when I was bent over, but poor, uh, she needs to go to a dog psychiatrist. Um, uh, bent over double, just thinking that life was pretty much over, you know. And I had the Samaritans on speed dial. Um, I would never have thought that I would have gone from that to being the person who I am now, who, you know, who's going to places and, and talking to people. 
you know. And I think it's actually just what happens as you get healthier. Like, as I've worked out my stuff, I just want to share that with other people. It just seems like a sort of, it's another one of those things. It's like, how did I get here? I'm not really sure how I got here. Uh, and I'm doing it. Yeah. A lot of this stuff is by definition for high achievers because you're a high achiever notwithstanding and it sounds as if the people you talk to are often high yes. achievers who've yes. had in one way or another to bottle it. Yes, yes I think you're Whatever right. Whatever it is. Yes, I hadn't thought about that. Yes, um, I am a high achiever and, and I continue to be so. You know, it's, it's great to talk to people and also like I continue to do my, you know, my, my job. Like, I'm doing a new record. I was out in, in the US recently doing stuff, which was just fascinating over there. Um, you know, I'm doing the podcast, all those kind of things. So I still feel like a high achiever. So I'm not coming from a place of like, I live in a yurt and I eat mud. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, and if we all just, Dressed in hemp 24-7, everything would be fine. It's like, no, no, I'm in this. <laughs> I'm doing it as well, you know. So I think that, that probably helps. Um, but yeah, you can bottle it up as a high achiever. Um, and also there's loads of things, because of course there's pressures. You know, once you start earning money and you have a family, you know, you need to keep on earning that money. You know, it's not just, people don't want to talk about money and the fact they need to pay a mortgage but that's like the reality of life you know we have to pay mortgages we have to pay bills and we also have to try and be as content as we can to our benefit actually the benefit of work um and the benefit of our families you know and our kids if we're parents but it's not easy to juggle all those things you know those things are majorly stressful